in the previous lecture we talked about the fate of uh, neutrons in a nuclear reactor you remember the design you have fuel core which uh, contains the fissile material and it is uh, surrounded by moderators the fuel rods are separated by the moderators in the reactor core and once you have some thermal neutrons ready to fission what happens to them that we discussed uh, last time just to remind you can look at the screen on which it is there. So, you have uh, these uh, n thermal neutrons in the fuel ready to cause fission and of them some are radiatively captured they are absorbed and uh, they do not cause fission those which cause fission create more fast neutrons so that factor we write as this uh, eta so here it is so from n it is n times eta fast neutrons then you these uh, some of these fast neutrons can also cause fission because of uh, uranium 238 and uh, that gives you this extra factor of epsilon so eta times epsilon then of these uh, neutrons which go to the moderator some of them encounter the uranium 238 fuel rod surface and they can get captured there uh, through those resonance reactions and therefore which are finally thermalized is here a factor p and after thermalization also they keep moving in the moderator for quite some time and during that time they can interact with the moderator material itself some uh, nuclear reactions can go in the moderator and another factor f is converted uh, is multiplied to get you slow neutrons uh, in the fuel rods once again. So, this is one complete generation or one complete cycle. So, in one generation if you have these n thermal neutrons the next generation here you have these n eta epsilon p f thermal neutron. So, from uh, one generation to the next generation the number of thermal neutrons in the fuel rod is multiplied by eta times epsilon times p times f which is known as reproduction factor, but we have uh, missed some points all this is if you have infinitely big core in any real nuclear reactor you will have finally, a finite volume and the neutrons which are moving with uh, fast neutrons or slow neutrons they can just leak out of that volume that can go out of the reactor core volume. So, fast neutrons here they can the, these fast neutrons which is produced some of them can go out of the of the core volume and that is that factor is leak factor L f then only 1 minus L f that factor is uh, going to the next uh, next uh, uh, channels. And similarly, once they are thermalized slow neutrons slow neutrons also during their random wandering they can move out of the core volume and that slow neutron leak if you write that as L s then only that 1 minus L s factor that will be, is be surviving. So, this should be multiplied by those uh, factors 1 minus L f and 1 minus L s. So, the fast neutrons leaking through the core volume and slow neutrons leaking through the core volumes that should be taken care then it is the reproduction factor k without these leak factors sometimes people say it k infinity assuming infinitely big core the factor will be eta into epsilon into p into f which is known as four factor formula because there are four factors here. So, this is uh, going from one generation to the next generation this is the factor k by which the number of thermal neutrons in the fuel rod ready to cause fission gets multiplied. Let us uh, see something else. 
So, that uh, factor k is that factor k is the factor by which the thermal neutrons are getting multiplied from one generation to the next generation, but how much time does it take from going from one generation to the next generation? The time scales. So, the time scales if you look at time scales if you look at the if the, the thermal neutrons get absorbed in uranium 235 they will fission almost uh, instantaneously some 10 to the power minus 14 seconds or so, but then uh, the fast neutrons which are created they will take some time wandering here and there and they, that lifetime of that neutron before, before it gets absorbed or it causes fission or something that is something like 10 to the power minus 8 second. So, fission itself may take very small time, but then the fast neutron lifetime in a typical case may be something like 10 to the power minus 8 second. Then they go to the moderator and their energy is reduced because of the collisions in the moderator and that thermalization that will take some time that will take some time and not only that after thermalization also the slow neutrons keep moving in the moderator volume here and there scattering from the moderator material. So, that time before they really get into the fuel rod that wandering time if you add that also wandering in moderator that is something like say 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 3 seconds milliseconds less than a millisecond. So, that is the largest time in all these. So, that finally, decides the time scale going from one generation to another generation it takes about a fraction of a millisecond. So, in that fraction of a millisecond 10 to the power minus 3 10 to the power minus 4 seconds those capital N new thermal neutrons in the fuel ready to cause fission have become capital N into k this k k times. So, n becomes n times k in this time frame 10 to the minus 3 seconds let us say. So, therefore, it is uh, essential that the reproduction factor this factor k is kept exactly at 1 almost exactly at 1, because if it is less than 1 then every millisecond the number of neutrons present in that thermal neutrons present is going down and whatever energy is created from this uh, nuclear reactions it is proportional to the number of these neutrons in the core and every millisecond if it is going down very soon it will all reduce to almost 0 and the chain reaction will stop. Similarly, if this k is slightly more than 1 then every millisecond the number of neutrons will keep on increasing by this factor k which is more than 1 and uh, in a very short time the rate of reactions will be so high that it will be uncontrollable. One can work out a, uh, a formula for that if uh, you write k as 1 plus epsilon where epsilon is a small quantity ideally we would like to keep it at 1. So, that the chain reaction sustains just sustains. So, one neutron causes fission and from that several neutrons are emitted and only one neutron of that on the average causes the next fission that is the ideal controlled nuclear reactant situation, but if it is slightly more or slightly less you can write it like this. In time t, in time t you have t 
t by two generations going on, where tau I am writing for this uh, uh, generation time scale here 10 by minus 3 seconds or so. So, these many generations have gone each generation it is getting multiplied by k that is 1 uh, plus epsilon. Therefore, the rate of reaction r at time t will be rate of reaction at time 0 and 1 plus uh, epsilon that is k t by tau power t by tau. So, the rate will depend on time the rate will increase with time if epsilon is positive through this. You can write it in a more familiar fashion you can take log of it. So, ln of r is equal to ln of r 0 and then this will be t by tau and ln this is log on the base e that is 1 plus epsilon here. And for a small epsilon this log of 1 plus epsilon to the base e will just be epsilon log of 1 plus x that series if you remember it starts with x x minus something something plus something something. So, this is ln of uh, r 0 and then t by tau and then this is epsilon okay. and therefore, if you write r that will be equal to r naught e to the power epsilon times t by tau. So, the rate changes exponentially if this epsilon is is positive it grows epsilon is negative a it goes down, but it goes exponentially and uh, the rate changes very fast. A typical example we can take suppose k is 1.01. So, that epsilon is 0.01 and in one second what happens to the rate. So, in one second if t is 1 and if tau is 10 to the power minus 3 second t is 1 second then this will be r at t equal to 1 second will be equal to r at 0 then e to the power epsilon which is 0 0.01 and that is multiplied by t by tau that is 1 second and divided by tau is 10 power minus 3 here. So, it is here. So, that will be 1000 and this will be 10. So, it is r into e to the power 10. Now, e you remember is around 2.73 or so. So, you can uh, work out on your calculator how much is this e to the power 10 and that will turn out to be approximately 22000. So, your rate is increased approximately by this factor 22000 in one second. So, every second every second the rate is increasing by more than 20000 factor. So, even a small increase in this reproduction factor k can lead to a very high energy output in very sh short time and it can be difficult to control and the things can go of hands and therefore, it, it, it must be maintained almost exactly at 1. How does one do that? For that one uses this control rods. Control rods are, are some uh, rods made of materials made of materials which absorb neutron cadmium is the most popular choice cadmium absorbs neutron. So, these rods are put in the core and the fuel rods are separated and these control rods can just go in between. So, when uh, you want to slow down the reaction these control rods are pushed inside. So, that they start absorbing more neutrons and the rate goes down and if uh, the rate has to be increased 
if k has become less than 1 and you want to make it k equal to 1 that is called critical the reactor is critical when k is 1 reactor is critical and if it is less than 1 it is called subcritical and if it is more than 1 it becomes supercritical dangerous. So, if it is subcritical and you want to make it critical you want to increase the rate of these fission reactions these cadmium rods are lifted up that means up or whatever. So, that uh, less uh, amount of less fraction of those rods are inside the core. So, that is how it is controlled, but if it is controlled by this mechanical movement of these rods then these mechanical movements cannot be or it is very difficult to uh, control that at this millisecond time scales 10 to the power minus 3, 10 to the power minus 4 second time scales. In that time scale uh, it has to mechanically go in or mechanically go out that will be very very difficult. So, how, how, how that is done that we are helped with a phenomena which is known as delayed neutrons. I talked about it earlier. In a, in a fission reaction some neutrons are immediately emitted those are known as prompt neutrons and we had talked about prompt neutrons in this uh, four factor formula and all that. But then some of these fract these uh, fission fragments they uh, they emit beta rays to reduce their n by z ratio and the product nucleus of this beta reaction that emits neutron. So, that is also possible for an for example, if you have a fission fragment uh, say 93 rubidium. So, this 93 rubidium that beta decays with a half life of 6 seconds and beta decays to 93 strontium and this uh, 93 strontium then emits a neutron and it becomes 92 strontium. Now, this neutron that is here it has come on the average 6 second later than the main fission event which has emitted which has created this fission fragment. So, this neutron has to wait because it will come from 93 strontium and 93 strontium will be created from 93 rubidium through this beta decay process which has a half life of 6 seconds and therefore, this neutron will come with a delay of uh, this order of time. So, these are known as delayed neutrons we had talked about these delayed neutrons earlier they are about 2 percent of the prompt neutrons, but that 2 percent gives us the handle. The whole design is made so that only on prompt neutrons the reactor is slightly subcritical and then uh, only when these delayed neutrons are taken into account it becomes critical. So, if that be the case only these uh, these delayed neutrons are needed to make it critical and these delayed neutrons are coming after few seconds uh, or, or, or 10 seconds or 6 seconds or 2 seconds or 5 seconds or 20 seconds then we get enough time to control that mechanical movement to follow the variation in k. So, that is how it is uh, it is controlled. Another aspect of this uh, chain reaction sustained chain reaction is that this reproduction factor depends on the temperature because this reproduction factor has all those absorption cross section and different reaction cross sections and so on and these uh, depend on the temperature. So, finally, this k also depends on the temperature. So, if the temperature goes up k can increase, k can decrease depending on the material, depending on the geometry and depending on the design. Now, if this k happens to be increasing with increasing temperature, then the situation will be difficult to control, because if the rate of reaction by any chance goes up and if the k is also 
increasing with temperature. So, in that case, so that means if d k d t this is greater than 0 and by any chance this temperature increases in the core because of anything less coolant flow we will talk about the coolant and all that due to any factor if this temperature goes up and k also increases then the rate of reaction will further be increased it, it has increased because of some factors uh, which we were not able to control and then the reaction rate also increases because of the increase in temperature and as the reaction rate increases the temperature will rise further and as the temperature will rise further the reaction will rate will again increase. So, it is something like a unstable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium in mechanics where you are sitting at the top of the of this uh, potential function and uh, if you slightly displace it, it further gets displaced and displaced and displaced. Similarly, here if by any chance temperature increases due to some factors reaction rate increases and reaction rate increases temperature increases further, the temperature increases further the reaction rate again goes up because of this positive factor. So, this uh, is a dangerous type of situation. So, for reactor stability what we say reactor stability for reactor stability this d k d t this should be negative. The choice of materials, the choice of design all that should be such that k as a function of temperature should give you d k by d t negative. In that case if the temperature goes up because of some factors the k the value of k decreases. So, the neutron multiplication is not that high and the rate of reaction will decrease and that will be some kind of self correction. If the temperature has increased the rate of reaction has decreased and the temperature has also gone down. So, this is for stability for reactor stability this d k by d t that should be less than 0. So, there are many things in reactor design I am only telling some essential parts in it. Now, what is the output of this reactor in what form the output is and in what form we need that output. The output of a nuclear reactor is in the form of this thermal energy generated when this fission takes place then uh, all this kinetic energy of the fission fragments and the neutrons all that is uh, absorbed finally, in that core volume itself and that increases its temperature. So, we say that heat is generated or thermal energy is generated that is the primary output in the core volume itself. After that what use we have to make the most common use is power generation electricity generation. So, there are the, the other uses can also be there to drive submarines to uh, get uh, some kinds of neutron beams for research and so on. But uh, let me talk of the, the electricity generation using these nuclear reactors. So, the heat that is created in this reactor volume that has to be taken out and then put in some use. So, for that uh, a typical design which most of Indian nuclear reactors have is what we call pressurized water reactor PWR and in place of water if you use heavy water then it is PHWR pressurized heavy water reactors. Most of our 20 nuclear reactors in India which are commercially producing electricity the 16 are of this type. So, what is that? In this that reactor core say if this is reactor core 
which contains all those fuels and control rods. So, let me schematically say that these are the fuel rods. and these are those control rods so the control rods can be inserted in can be taken out and in this we put water or heavy water at very high pressure so this is water H 2 O or D 2 O at very high pressure and pressures are of the order of say 100 atmosphere and this is sent into this, this at high pressure some pump is there, some tower is there from there this uh, pressure is maintained and this water is pushed in. Okay, and that this water goes out of this through another outlet. So, it goes out and at this high pressure the boiling point of water goes up and reaches something like 300 degrees Celsius or so and uh, uh, therefore, it remains in liquid form although the temperature increases to say 2 to 50 degree or so much above the normal boiling point. So, the heat of this core is taken out of this core through this coolant, this is coolant, this water acts as coolant, one can have another types of coolant depending on the design, but for this PWR or PHWR it is cooled by this high pressure water, water maintained at high pressure, water sent at high pressure and then taken out. It not only acts as a coolant to take the heat out, it is also the moderator, the same water is also the moderator. So, the fuel rods are surrounded by moderator, so that water is acting as moderator and the same water is taking away the heat, it is getting heated because of this, this coolant is cold water is coming from here and then hot water is going from here, the so, heat is taken from here. Now, after that, that heat is used uh, for steam generation to run a turbine, it will go in some kind of heat exchanger. You can have different designs of heat exchangers, one design would be to take tubes, take this water through tubes. and so on. So, the hot water is coming like this at some 250 degrees or so at very high pressure, it will finally be recycled, this will go here, when it becomes cold it will go here and here one can send say cold water at relatively low pressure. So, that uh, heat is given by this hot water in the tubes to the cold water in this chamber and this water boils because it is not at that high pressure and therefore, it boils and makes a steam. So, here it makes a steam and that steam can be taken to that turbine chamber, to that turbine chamber to run that turbine and then that steam can go to another heat exchanger and from here that steam can you can call it condenser, condenser. So, you send uh, this cold thing here. So, this steam becomes water condenses here and then it can that cold water can go to so, the coolant and the moderator both functions are done by this water or heavy water. What is the difference between water and heavy water? Moderator has to be a low z material, 
if it is low z material it will reduce the kinetic energy of the neutron very effectively and therefore water which contains hydrogen the lightest nuclei would be ideal from that kinematics but then uh, the neutron absorption is also very important this uh, proton or hydrogen nucleus proton that can capture a neutron to make the stable isotope deuteron. So, there is a reasonable cross section for that. So, the, uh, the, the neutrons get absorbed uh, significantly if you if one uses light water. In that case to keep the reaction at a reasonable rate one has to use enriched uranium. So, uranium natural uranium has 0 0.7 percent of uranium 235 and this uranium 235 is the main nuclear fuel in this type of reactors. So, it has to be enriched some 3, 3 percent, 4 percent, 5 percent then light waters light water can be used as moderator. But if heavy water is used in moderator then uh, that uh, absorption cross section for neutron is small although deuteron can also absorb neutron to make that triton 3 h and worse it is radioactive deuteron is not radioactive this uh, triton is radioactive but then the cross sections are small the probabilities of that absorption is much smaller than the probability of proton absorbing a neutron and making deuteron so with heavy water as moderator and coolant one can use natural uranium without enrichment. So, it is a trade off uh, heavy water is costly one has to make heavy water from light water that involves its own uh, complications, but then this enrichment of uranium that is that can be saved and natural uranium can be used. So, that that is uh, the difference between P W R and P H W R. Now, another type of uh, reactors are called breeder reactors. In fact, Indian nuclear program is called three stage nuclear program. So, let, let us first talk what is breeder reactor. Now, breeder reactor is where you breed the nuclear fuel. You know the fissile material uranium 235 and plutonium 239 and uranium 233 fissile which can be used in a nuclear reactor where neutron goes into it and makes the fission. Now, let us take this as a, as a typical example uranium plutonium 239 how it is formed it is formed by the absorption of neutron in uranium 238 that gives 239 uranium and then it beta decays and after beta decay it gives you neptunium and that gives you finally, uh, plutonium 239. So, it can be produced plutonium 239 can be produced if neutron is bombarded on uranium 238. Now, in a normal power reactor thermal reactor where we use natural uranium as a fuel or even enriched uranium as a fuel there is a lot of uranium 238 available. For natural uranium you have 99.3 percent 
uranium 238 and even if you enrich the uranium to some 4 5 percent of uranium 235, you have lo lots of uranium 238 available. Even the spent fuel rods where the uranium 235 is now over or it is so small that it is cannot it cannot be used any more for power production, it is uranium 238 in plenty. Now, of the fast neutrons which are created in a fission event, one neutron can go to this uranium 238 and make it plutonium 239, you will be producing new fissile material. So, if a reactor is designed in such a way that from fission you have say 2.5 neutrons and one neutron is needed for sustaining the chain reaction, still you have 1.5 neutrons. If it can be designed that out of that 1.5, one is directed towards a uranium 238, then you are producing one fissile nucleus from when you consume one fissile nucleus of uranium 235. So, this type of reactor although with uh, uh, 2.5 uh, neutrons it will be very very difficult to do this, but this type of uh, reactors which consume a fissile material to produce electricity or power or whatever and then from the neutrons which are being lost radiatively captured this that if one neutron can be assured to cause this conversion of uranium 238 to plutonium 239, we are just producing the same amount of uh, fissile material and if it can be more than one on the average, then we will be producing more fissile material than what we are consuming. So, such reactors are called breeder reactors. So, you have seen that uh, these neutrons which are produced in a fission reaction if it is uranium 235, you get something like on the average nu equal to 2.5 and if it is a mixture of uranium 235 and uranium 238, which will always be the case with lots of uh, uranium 238, the average number of fast neutrons which come out from one fission reaction in a natural uranium or enriched uranium will be much less than 2.5. For natural uranium it is 1.33 and for 3 percent enriched uranium it is 1.84. Why? Because uranium 238 which is plenty in that mixture in that fuel that is not giving a fission that is only absorbing the neutrons. So, in, in that sense the factor is not 2.5, the eta that we use in that four fa factor formula is 1.33 or 1.84 and that cannot be used for breeder reactions. For breeder reactor, you do need uh, eta more than 2 because one neutron is needed to sustain that chain reaction at a constant rate and at least one neutron is needed to produce this new fissile material. So, two are needed and all kinds of absorption and leaking and all those things will be there. So, this new has to be or eta has to be much more than uh, uh, much more than two. So, breeder reactor is built with plutonium 239 as the fuel. Okay. So, breeder reactors one neutron to sustain the chain reaction and more than one neutron if it is to it had to breed. So, if it has to produce more nuclear fuel than it is consuming there should be in fact more than one 
न्यूट्रॉन फॉर ब्रीडिंग एंड देर फोर दैट ईटा मस्ट बी ग्रेटर देन टू नॉट ओनली ग्रेटर देन टू इज रीजनेबली ग्रेटर देन टू so that after all those uh, radiative absorption and leaking through the core and all those things absorption in the moderator still you have these uh, two neutrons or more than two neutrons available one for sustaining the reaction and one for breeding the fissile material and plutonium 239 is is reasonably or is perhaps is the only good choice because for this you can get eta around 3 with uh, uranium 235 plus uranium 238 the usual fuel in the nuclear fission reactors that will give you eta say 1.33 for natural uranium and 1.84 for 3% enriched uranium now this cannot be used now this thermalization low kinetic energy of neutrons moderation all these things were for uranium reactor because the cross section of fission for uranium 235 is very high uh, 500 600 bars at these thermal energies so to utilize that all that moderator was needed and other things so that uh, neutron can be taken out of that fuel rods fast neutrons they their kinetic energy is reduced and then sent to the fuel rods again so that that large cross section of fission uh, uh, for this uranium 235 can be utilized plutonium 239 doesn't need that it can fission with uh, fast neutrons itself and therefore no moderators are needed in breeder reactors in breeder reactors is just the fast neutrons which are produced from a fission they themselves uh, fission go for the next generation fission and so the moderators are not needed as such coolant has to go from outside the core and normally liquid sodium is used as as coolant in this uh, breeder reactors and they are known as fast breeder reactors there is another classification of reactors if the if the reactor is using thermal neutrons if thermal neutrons are causing the fission that kind is known as thermal fission reactor another is intermediate energy moderation is there but intermediate energy that is another possibility you can call it intermediate fission reactor and then the fast neutrons then the fast neutrons if fast neutrons are producing the next generation fission then you call it fast reactor so breeder reactors in the present designs are all fast reactors because the fast neutrons which are produced in fission of plutonium 239 they themselves cause the next generation fission so they are generally termed as fast breeder reactors fbr another breeding reaction that is important or possible is with thorium thorium 90 z is 90 and a is 232 this thorium this is also available in fact india has large reserves of uh, this thorium 
this is not fissile material as such, but if a neutron is absorbed in it, it can create 233 thorium and this can beta decay to protectium P A uh, and that can again beta decay. So, this will be 233 here and it can again beta decay and this will become 92 that is uranium and 233. So, this is a fissile material 233 uranium. So, a breeding reaction is, is possible if you have 232 thorium which absorbs neutron and then from there it can finally, give this. So, but this uh, 232 thorium this itself is, is to be placed properly there. So, that the, uh, the neutrons from this fission reactions get absorbed into it. So, what we have in India it is called three stage nuclear program of India and what are those three stages let us see. So, three stage nuclear energy program of India. The final vision is to use that large availability of thorium in India. The uranium reserves are limited, but the thorium reserves are in much more better conditions. So, keeping that in mind, the first stage is to expand a, this uh, fission reactors PHWR or PWR using uranium fuel as usual, there is a usual variety all fission reactors in the world most of them are of this variety. So, expand presently 20 such reactors are in use 16 use this uh, heavy water then two boiling water reactors, boiling water reactors means the coolant and moderator that water that is going that boils there itself, the pressure is not that high. So, it boils in that core itself and the steam is from there itself taken to the turbine so, that is boiling water reactor two of them. So, expand this, expand is uh, build more reactors uh, not only that we need electricity from that, but the another output is that from this we will get lot of plutonium 239, because uh, in that natural uranium those uranium 238 is there which are getting irradiated by the neutrons in a natural way in the reactor. Plutonium 239 is being made there and from that it can be separated chemically. So, by expanding this nuclear reactor base we will be getting more plutonium 239. So, that is plus electricity of course. Then the second stage, so this gives this gives us as an output plutonium 239. Now, use this plutonium 239 second stage fast breeder reactors FBRs. fast breeder reactors will need plutonium 239 as fuel and if we go for large amount of breeding number of FBRs, then we will need corresponding amount of plutonium 239 as fuel. And for that we need the first uh, phase reactors normal uranium reactors, which will give us that plutonium 239 
fuel. So, this will be used here to, uh, to construct to run these FBRs and in these FBRs this thorium, thorium 232 will be irradiated then that will give us 233 uranium. So, once those fast breeder reactors are in place with plutonium 239 as fuel, in those fast breeder reactors we can breed uranium 233, we can put our thorium uh, fuel there not fuel thorium, thorium material there and irradiate with these neutrons breed that and then from using this react reaction here, we can get this fissile material uranium 233 and then the third stage is to build reactors with this 233 uranium as the fuel. So, we are at uh, uh, first stage at, at present, but one FBR in fact FBTR fast breeder test reactor is running for quite some time 1985 or so. So, we have all that technology all those things ready and one small reactor at Kalpakam is also running at uh, uranium 233. So, all the technical aspects are, are all well tested and it is only a matter of uh, doing it first stage, second stage and third stage. Now, one more aspect must be talked when we are talking of nuclear reactor and that is safety aspect because when uh, these fission reactors reactions take place they create lot of radioactive material all these fission fragments are radioactive they beta decay they emit neutrons and so on some of them have a small lifetime some of them have large lifetime thousands of years or even more so we are producing that much of radioactive material which has lo long lifetime as well so, to keep that radioactive material isolated from water mass, from air mass, from human population that is very, very important. So, in any nuclear power plant lots of radioactive materials are being produced. The spent fuel rods they are all radioactive emitting radiations. So, to keep them uh, we are running the reactors we are piling up all these spent fuel rods. So, to keep all that radioactive waste from fission reactor is a big challenge and if something goes wrong and if this radioactive material goes into the human populations through whatever means that will be disaster. So, that is one thing containment of this radioactive material and the final disposal, final disposal, finally what will happen? We can keep this in our reactor complex in an isolated uh, building and so on, but if it is piling up at the end of it the 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1000 years from now what will be its final disposal that is one issue. Another issue is accidents with all the good designs and everything accidents do occur. In the history of nuclear fission reactions we had three big accidents. So, let me give it on the screen those three famous big accidents. So, you can see there are three serious nuclear reactor accidents so far in the whole history. One is known as this uh, three mile Iceland in USA that was in 1979 and uh, in this uh, there was some uh, malfunctioning of instruments some valve uh, got stuck something happened and the operators could not respond to that well and so both malfunctioning of instrument and human error that uh, caused explosions and meltdown of the of, of the these fuels and all that. So, that was 1979. Then the worst is Chernobyl former USSR in 1986 there also it was essentially 
some malfunctioning and some human error and uh, this was the one in which some loss of life was there and also health hazards increase in cancer cases and other things. This is the worst and very recently as everyone knows in Japan Fukushima 2011 no human error here and no instrument failure here, but it was a natural calamity. When this 15 meters of tsunami waves entered the complex, disrupted the power supply, the cooling could not be done. Although the reactor was shut down automatically from the design itself, but even if it is shut down, the radioactive decay continues and that creates heat and that could not be cooled and everyone knows that uh, this entire complex is now unusable for any, anything. So, but this was a natural calamity, but so far no loss of life has been reported or even the radi radiation exposure is not very highly alarming to the workers and, and people there, but this Chernobyl surely uh, it is created a lot of problems and some uh, some 50, 56 or something is uh, reported casualties, human life casualties and so on. So, this safety aspect has to be kept in mind when we talk of re reactors and expansion of nuclear programs and, and all those things. All these three accidents had, had to, have taught us to deal with uh, such situations and we hope that no more nuclear accidents in future.